Welcome to the first installment of First Chapter Fridays. Staff at the Wyckoff Library will be sharing part or all of the first chapter of a book that they enjoyed and would like to recommend. Tonight I'll be reading the first chapter of The Storied Life of A.J. Fickery by Gabrielle Zevin. Actually, I'm only going to read part of it because it's about 25 pages long and it would just take me too much time. So the reason I love this book is um, it's about the power of stories, the love of books, love of bookstores, and um, a sense of community and how coming together we can really all help each other in positive ways. So I'm going to get started on page eight. Um, a, a young sales rep named Amelia is out from her bookstore meeting the owner of Island Books, A.J. Fickery, for the first time. Uh, he's kind of notorious for being an odd, sometimes cranky person. Um, it's not a big store, it's not a big account, but it's still important to them. Here we go. Island Books, Alice Island's exclusive provider of fine literature content since 1999. No man is an island. Every book is a world. Inside, a teenager mines the till while reading the new Alice Munro collection. Oh, how is that one? Amelia asks. Amelia adores Munro, but aside from vacation, she rarely has time to read books that aren't on the list. Meh, it's for school, the girl replies, as if that settles the question. Amelia introduces herself as the sales rep from Nightly Press and the teenager, without looking up from the page, points vaguely in the back, AJ's in his office. Precarious stacks of arcs and galleys line the hallway, and Amelia feels the usual flash of despair. The tote bag that is embossing her shoulder has several additions for AJ's piles, and a catalog filled with other books for her to pitch. She never lies about the books on her list. She never says she loves a book if she doesn't. She can usually find something positive to say about a book or, failing that, the cover, or, failing that, the author, or, failing that, the author's website. And that's why they pay me the big bucks, Amelia occasionally jokes to herself. She makes $37,000 per year, plus the possibility of bonuses, though no one who does her job has made a bonus for a very long time. The door to A.J. Fickery's office is closed. Amelia is halfway to it when the sleeve of her sweater catches on one of the stacks and 100 books, maybe more, crash to the ground with a mortifying thunder. The door opens and A.J. Fickery looks from the wreckage to the dirty blonde giantess who is frantically trying to repile the books. Who the hell are you? Amelia Lohman. She stacks 10 more tomes and half of them tumble down. Oh, leave it, AJ commands. There's an order to these things. You're not helping. Please, leave. Amelia stands. She is at least four inches taller than AJ. But we have a meeting. We have no meeting, AJ says. We do, Amelia insists. I emailed you last week about the winter list. You said it was fine for me to come by either Thursday or Friday afternoon. I said I'd come on Thursday. The email exchange had been brief, but she knows it was not fiction. You're a rep? Amelia nods, relieved. What publisher again? Nightly. Nightly Press is Harvey Rhodes, AJ replies. When you emailed me last week, I thought you were Harvey's assistant or something. I'm Harvey's replacement. <sighs> AJ sighs heavily. What, what company has Harvey gone to? Harvey's dead. And for a second, Amelia considers making a bad joke, casting the afterlife as a sort of company and Harvey as an employee in it. He's dead, she says flatly. I thought you would have heard. Most of her accounts had already heard. Harvey had been a legend as much as the sales rep can be a legend. There was an obituary in the ABA newsletter and maybe one in Publishers Weekly too, she says by way of apology. 
Uh, I don't much follow publishing news, AJ says. He takes off his thick black glasses and then spends a long time wiping the frames. I'm sorry if it's a shock to you. Amelia puts her hand on AJ's arm and he shakes it off. What do I care? I barely knew the man. I saw him three times a year. Not enough to call him a friend. And every time I saw him, he was trying to sell me something. That is not a friendship. Amelia can tell that AJ is in no mood to be pitched the winter list. She should offer to come back another day. But then she thinks of the two hour drive to Hyannis and the 80 minute boat ride to Alice and the ferry schedule, which becomes more irregular after October. Since I'm here, Amelia says, would you mind if we went through Knightley's winter titles? AJ's office is a closet. It has no windows, no pictures on the wall, no family photos on the desk, no knickknacks, no escape. The office has books, inexpensive metal shelves like the kind for a garage, a filing cabinet, and an ancient, possibly 20th century desktop computer. AJ does not offer her a drink, and although Amelia is thirsty, she doesn't ask for one. She clears a chair of books and sits. Amelia launches into the winter list. It's the smallest list of the year, both in size and expectations. A few big, or at least promising, debuts, but other than that, it's filled with the books for which the publisher has the lowest commercial hopes. Despite this, Amelia often likes the winters the best. They're the underdogs, the sleepers, the long shots. It's not too much of a stretch to point out that this is how she sees herself too. She leaves for last her favorite book, a memoir written by an 80 year old man, a lifelong bachelor who married at the age of 78. His bride died two years after the wedding at the age of 83, cancer. According to his bio, the writer worked as a science reporter for various Midwestern newspapers, and the prose is precise, funny, not at all maudlin. Amelia had cried uncontrollably on the train from New York to Providence. Amelia knows The Late Bloomer is a small book and that the description sounds more than a little cliche, but she feels sure other people will love it if they give it a chance. In Amelia's experience, most people's problems would be solved if they would only give things more of a chance. Amelia is halfway through describing the late bloomer when AJ puts his head on his desk. Is something wrong? Amelia asks. This is not for me, AJ says. Just try the first chapter. Amelia is pushing the galley into his hand. I know the subject matter could be incredibly corny, but when you see how it's writ, he cuts her off. This is not for me. Okay, so I'll tell you about something else. AJ takes a deep breath. <sighs> you seem like a nice enough young woman, but your predecessor? The thing is, Harvey knew my tastes. He had the same taste as me. Amelia sets the galley on the desk. I'd like a chance to get to know your tastes, she says. He mutters something under his breath. She thinks it sounds like, what's the point? But she isn't sure. Amelia closes the nightly catalog. Mr. Fickery, please tell me what you like. Like, he repeats with distaste. How about I tell you what I don't like? I don't like postmodernism, post-apocalyptic settings, post-mortem narrators, or magical realism. I rarely respond to supposedly clever formal devices, multiple fonts, pictures where there shouldn't be. Basically, gimmicks of any kind. I find literary fiction about the Holocaust or any other major world tragedy to be distasteful. Non-fiction only, please. I do not like genre mashups, a la the literary detective novel or the literary fantasy. Literary should be literary and genre should be genre and crossbreeding rarely results in anything satisfying. I do not like children's books, especially ones with orphans, and I prefer not to clutter my shelves with young adults. I do not like anything over 400 pages or under 150. 
I am repulsed by ghost-written novels by reality television stars, celebrity picture books, sports memoirs, movie tie-in editions, novelty items, and I imagine this goes without saying, a vampires. I rarely stock debuts, chiclet, poetry, or translations. I would prefer not to stock series, but the demands of my top pop, excuse me, the demands of my pocketbook require me to. For your part, you needn't tell me about the next big series until it's ensconced on the New York Times bestseller list. Above all, Miss Lohman, I find slim literary memoirs about the old men whose little old wives had died from cancer to be absolutely intolerable. No matter how well written the sales rep claim they are, no matter how many copies you promise I'll sell on Mother's Day. Amelia blushes, though she is angry more than embarrassed. She agrees with some of what AJ has said, but his manner is unnecessarily insulting. Nightly Press doesn't even sell half of that stuff anyway. She studies him. He's older than Amelia, but not by much, not by more than 10 years. He's too young to like so little. What do you like? She asks. Everything else, he says. I will also admit to occasional weakness for short story collections. Customers never want to buy them though. There's only one short story collection on Amelia's list, a debut. Amelia hasn't read the whole thing and time dictates that she probably won't, but she liked the first story. An American sixth grade class and an Indian sixth grade class participate in an international pen pal program. The narrator is an Indian kid in the American class who keeps feeding comical misinformation about Indian culture to the Americans. She clears her throat, which is still terribly dry. <clears throat> the year Bombay became Mumbai, I think it will have special int- No, he says. I haven't even told you what it's about yet. Just no. But why? If you're honest with yourself, you'll admit that the only reason you're telling me this is because I'm partially Indian and you think this will be my special interest. Am I right? Okay, I'm gonna stop there for tonight. Um, but you can find the uh, digital copy of this book as well as the audiobook on Hoopla and you can check that out for free with your library card. I think you'll really enjoy hearing what happens to both AJ, Amelia, and all the members of Alice Island. Thanks and have a great night.